Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Old News, where the fossils are old, but discoveries are new. My name is Laura Beth. I'm going to be your host, so I'll be keeping an eye on our live chat, uh, making sure we don't miss any questions or comments from you all. And of course, we have Dr. Christian Kammerer, the museum's research curator of paleontology, here to share all of the exciting paleontology news. So say hello to Christian. Hey, Christian. Hey, Albie. Good to be here. I know, I'm so excited. And um, actually, I forgot to mention to you all, if you would like to play Old News Bingo along with this program, I put a link in the chat. So check that out. And we do have automatic captions available if you click the CC button on the YouTube video. So we're super excited for you all to join us today. And I know that I'm excited to talk about bears, amber bears. Um, before we really jump in, I did wanna share a quick I guess uh, like a life update with everybody. Um, as many of you regulars know, um, I am not a paleontologist, right? Um, you may have figured that out by the fact that I can't pronounce half of the the names, the scientific names of our new discoveries. Oh, I think I think you do just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Christian. I appreciate it. Um, but I did get to go and do some paleontology field work last week with. Christian. So Christian invited me, myself and some other um, co-workers out into the field. And this is one of my favorite pictures from the day. So uh, we're all taking a break while Christian does a lot of the heavy, heavy work in the background. Are you using a circular saw, Christian? Yeah, rock saw, uh, cut off oh. saw. Nice. Yeah. So um, here's a little close up of that again and i thought it'd just be really cool to show you all what you know paleontology field work looks like and mm -hmm. i was really excited i think um one thing that i learned is that paleontology is really hard work <laughs> so you're literally you know chiseling away at rock that's been there for um about what 200 million years or so yeah around that 220 or so for the rocks that we were working in oh okay only 220 million years yeah, yeah that's I mean, it really doesn't want to budge, so you have it to is, have a lot of patience. Yeah, super, super hard stuff. So, I mean, it, it differs from strata to strata. You can work in some areas where it's it's not super consolidated, so it hasn't been, like, really hardened. And you can basically just kind of, like, brush sand off of the fossil or brush dirt off of the fossil. Um, but in the Triassic and earlier, you tend to get very, very well consolidated rock. So Triassic stuff, uh, super solid that we have out here. And really, yeah, you got to use the saw uh, to get it out. Even we've tried to use jackhammers to that site before and it just bounces off the surface. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. Man. Yeah, well, it was so much fun, even though, you know, it was a huge workout for me. <laughs> Um, definitely, I was excited to join, but also excited that I don't do this every single day. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think let's go ahead and get started talking about amber bears. Yeah. So bears, bears of a sort. Um, so the idea of a whole bear being preserved in amber uh, probably seems ludicrous and, and in a way is. Uh, but there are some some little creatures that are called bears that have uh, been preserved in such a manner. Um, so let me introduce you to them. So it's uh, it's these things. So, Loretta, do you know what one of these is? Um, yes, I do. It's a water bear, a tardigrade. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, these are, these are microscopic invertebrates uh, that are variously called water bears or moss piglets. Um, and they're this members of the phylum tardigrada. Uh, and so these are very, very small. So these are things in, in the microns range. So smaller even than a millimeter, uh, usually eight legged little kind of squat and lumpy creatures uh, that live in aquatic ecosystems of all kinds. So they're in marine ecosystems, they're in freshwater, they're even found in little water droplets in in moss, hence the name moss piglets. Uh, they're they're quite common actually. So they're uh, many many known species. And anytime you pull up uh, some pond water and look at it under a microscope, you've got a pretty good chance of seeing a water bear. Um, 
So as a group, they're members of this, uh, this larger taxon here, this larger clade called Ecdysozoa, and their exact position in there is, is still somewhat debatable. Um, here's the tardigrades here shown outside of a group containing the, the velvet worms, the onychophorans, and then the arthropods, which is the biggest and in many ways most successful of all the, the animal phyla. So that's insects, arachnids, crustaceans, centipedes, millipedes, their allies. Um, hugely diverse and ecologically dominant group. And then these, these smaller but still important groups. So it's still a little unclear whether tardigrades or onychophorans are the closest living relatives of arthropods. Uh, but it's one of those two, and they're definitely closely related regardless. So uh, they are now thought to form this larger taxon with, uh, with nematodes, with roundworms, uh, which was unexpected when it was first recovered, uh, but now has become very well supported based on, on DNA evidence, based, looking at genetic similarity between all these animals. So it's been called uh, ecdysozoa which basically means shedding animals. Because these are all phyla that uh, they grow by molting. So they shed their skin um, when they're growing to larger size. And so tardigrades, they're, they're similar to arthropods. They have, uh, they have kind of a, a chitinous, uh, not, not really an exoskeleton, but the, so what's called the cuticle. And, and they shed that as, as they grow. So tardigrades uh, used to be actually quite an obscure group, but I feel like they are having a cultural moment where tardigrades are in pop culture. Uh, tardigrades are becoming very widely known by the general public. I remember when I was a kid, you know, maybe being the only person in school who knew what a tardigrade was. Now I feel like anyone with sort of a passing interest in animals has, has seen water bears and knows about them, um, in part because I think they are pretty cute. Uh, as microscopic, multi-legged, sort of jointed organisms go, uh, they're fairly adorable. Um, the Christian, other thing is, yeah? Sorry, can I just add that there's this amazing um, song on YouTube. I, I cannot remember who sings it because I just remembered it, but um, it's called Water Bear Don't Care. Okay. So I, I, um, I encourage everybody to look that up. It will get stuck in your head, but in the best way. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, the other uh, other microscopic myofaunal phyla are not getting songs written about them. There's no, like, nathostomulids or lorisiferin songs out there that we're aware of. Although, hey, people in the audience, maybe you could be the first one to write lorisiferin uh, music. Uh, but, yeah, I think they, they definitely captured the imagination uh, both for their cuteness and also because there's been a lot of research and news associated with um, how powerful they are at sort of surviving extreme conditions. So they're very good, uh, remarkably good, in fact, at what's called cryptobiosis. So cryptobiosis, it means uh, basically hidden life. And it's an apt name because it's when an organism uh, in extreme conditions gets you know, basically as close to death as possible without actually dying. So, you know, when conditions are bad, they enter this cryptobiotic state where the metabolism usually drops very close to zero. And then when conditions improve, they're able to get back to their active state. So this is showing one example of this here. And there are a number of different kinds of cryptobiosis, many of which are practiced by tardigrades. Uh, this is anhydrobiosis, which is basically the, the loss of water from the body. So you have the, uh, this is an SEM, a scanning electron micrograph, very powerful uh, microscope image of a, an active tardigrade at the left, sort of as it would be sort of cruising around, living its life, um, living in water. Uh, but when, let's say it lives in a pond and that pond dries up, uh, how does it survive? So they actually can lose uh, almost all the water in their body. So they can go down to 1% of their water content and stay alive. They just enter what's called the ton state. So this inactive, essentially uh, metabolically static, uh, desiccated state. And then when they get water in them again, they basically come back to life. Uh, and, and can go back to doing what they do. And so there's been a lot of research looking at both the sort of inherent biological interest of this, but also maybe practical applications for, for space travel uh, and 
among other things, you know, tardigrades have been put in super cold climates and super hot climates. They've been put in the vacuum of space uh, and, you know, they've survived a lot of that. So they're really remarkable survivors. And so I think this has really sort of captured the public imagination that there are, there are animals out there uh, that can get so close to death and still basically be okay. And indeed do this all the time. Like this is a, a common part of many tardigrades life cycle of dealing with the, the seasons. So they're not, they're not extremophiles. Uh, I've heard them, sometimes people say that uh, extremophiles are organisms that prefer to live in extreme environments, like the bacteria that live in hydrothermal vents. Like they only live in superheated water with like toxic chemicals there. Tardigrades would prefer not to live in those bad conditions, but they can survive them uh, if those come up. Um, hey, Christian. Yeah. Sorry. Can I ask a quick, quick question? Um, yeah, so the bears, it. the bears we usually think of that, you know, may go through hibernation. Is that a form of cryptobiosis or no? Yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, that's a very slight one, but, uh, it's definitely on that. It's on that spectrum. So like you can go, it's everywhere from, 1% water and z near zero, like 0, 0 0.1 uh, metabolic activity to, you know, things like frogs and turtles that bury themselves in the mud in the winter and maybe their bodies, you know, get partially frozen and their metabolism goes down really low, uh, forms of estivation and hibernation. And then mammals, uh, you know, tend to deal with sort of, I'd say, less extreme cases than that. But yeah, bears are definitely, uh, you know, getting into sort of a cryptobiotic state when they're hibernating. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. it's all it's all very sort of similar, uh, similar background for like why these animals are are going through this process. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so yeah, there are some parallels between real bears and the water bears. Uh, they're mostly like called water bear though, just cause they, they've got claws and they're kind of like little and stumpy as they, they look kind of bear like when they're crawling around with just, uh, two extra pairs of legs on them. Um, so tardigrades are kind of the ultimate survivors among living things. Uh, but when you look at their fossil record there, it turns out they're not very good at surviving the fossilization process or rather it is. Uh, they are poorly suited to, to preserve as fossils. Um, and so despite the fact that tardigrades are hugely, you know, they're diverse, they're abundant, um, they're present in lots and lots of ecosystems today, uh, they have an incredibly poor fossil record. So, uh, you know, when you think of things that will fossilize poorly, like jellyfish have a better fossil record than tardigrades. And jellyfish, they're, they're just goo. <laughs> I mean, how do those even fossilize? Uh, well, the answer is, is exceptional preservation in lithographic limestones for jellyfish. But uh, there are, you know, there's, there's a handful of fossil jellyfish out there. For tardigrades, um, it, it's really the size is a problem. So they're soft bodied and they're microscopic. So there are, you know, there are lots of researchers who work on micro fossils but they're mostly looking at the hard parts, things like shells of protozoans, shelled amoebae and uh, shelled algae and things like that. Um, when it's soft bodied, you're really out of luck unless you're dealing with some pretty unusual, unusual uh, preservational systems. Um, but thankfully there is, there is one type of preservation that is suited towards preserving uh, small bodied soft things uh, and that's amber. So amber, all, probably all familiar with this is fossilized resin or tree sap. Um, so it is, it's paleobotanical, uh, but it's also uh, frequently preserves little animals that get stuck in the resin and then are fossilized along with it. So most famously insects, like, you know, see in Jurassic Park, there's mosquitoes trapped in amber, uh, but lots of, of other types of insects as well as arachnids, crustaceans and all sorts of small invertebrates and a few vertebrates, although those are super rare, uh, have get stuck in amber. 
And so Amber is really the best place to look if there is any hope of finding a fossil tardigrade. Now, even with that, it is, it's a real needle in a haystack situation because, you know, you, you look at Amber and, you know, there are, there's thousands and thousands of pieces of Amber out there. It is, Amber is interesting because it's, it's both a fossil and it is a gemstone. So there's a big commercial industry for it. So there's a lot of Amber that is coming, you know, going uh, up for sale. And so a lot of pieces that people are looking at, but for the most part, they're looking for, well, if it's, Purely as a gemstone, they're looking for a flawless, like without inclusions, just like nice, uh, clear stone. But if you're looking for inclusions, generally you're looking like with the naked eye or sort of a simple like microscope at insects in there. You're not going through every single amber thing under scanning electron microscope, trying to see ridiculously tiny microscopic stuff. So there it's hard to, you know, try to track down something like a tardigrade. But thankfully, a few have shown up in Amber. So there were, there were two. There were two uh, tardigrades in Amber. So the first was described in 1964. Uh, you can see that kind of blurry photo at top. This is a, a taxon called Bjorn from the late Cretaceous of uh, Canadian Amber. Uh, so that's actually named after the, the werebear from The Hobbit. Uh, so another sort of bear-like creature there. And that's been a, a controversial taxon. It's definitely a tardigrade, but it is the, not super clear what kind of tardigrade it is. There's been a lot of debate between tardigradeologists, because uh, even when you look at the specimen, apparently it's, it's kind of blurry like that. It's not, not just the photo. Uh, they've had difficulty sort of figuring out what is what in it. Um, the other one, which is actually the oldest known tardigrade in amber, is a, a specimen of this genus Milnesium, which is still alive today. And so the, the, the SEM that you see there is actually of, of a living Milnesium, but the fossil one looks basically identical. Uh, and that's from Turonian, so also late Cretaceous amber from New Jersey, uh, what's called the Raritan amber. So you had basically just the uh, tardigrade records in you know the past billion years of, of earth's history um until and so and sorry this is i was just showing you where they they are in the late cretaceous until now so they've added a third there is now a third amber tardigrade and this one's actually younger so this is in uh amber from the miocene so well into the cenozoic the what's so-called age of mammals so this is around 15 16 million years old not as old as the cretaceous stuff uh but still a very intriguing discovery so this is this is the the new amber tardigrade only the third known in history um and it's called the uh somewhat of a tongue twister uh but i do enjoy it the name is uh, Paradoryphoribius chronocaribius. And so that's in reference to it being very similar to a living genus of tardigrade called Doryphoribius. Um, so para in Greek means beside and is often used for animals that are similar to other animals like the dinosaur Parasaurolophus was thought to be similar to Saurolophus, that sort of thing. And then chronocaribius refers to its origin. So it's in Dominican amber. So these are uh, amber fossils found in the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. Um, so they are from sort of tro uh, prehistoric tropical forests. Specifically, it's thought to all come from a single species of tree uh, that's now extinct uh, called Hymenaea proterra. Uh, there is, are living Hymenaea trees in Brazil and other parts of South America, and they have, you know, very, they exude a lot of, of sap, a lot of resin. So the, the fossil hymenaeas that would have been living in what is now the Dominican Republic uh, were constantly sort of oozing this resin and captured a remarkably large number of invertebrates like little Paradori Faribius here, um, depicted you know, at great magnification coming off of water droplets in the moss where it would have been living. And the discovery of this one actually is interesting. So the, the researchers who were working on it did not go out looking for fossil tardigrades. Um, the chunk of amber that Paradori Faribius is in also contains ants. And so ant researchers looking at ants in amber 
uh, were, you know, examining them at great detail under the microscope. And I guess just looked over in the corner and like, hey, what's that little thing in there? And it turned out to be just the, the third tardigrade in amber. So this is this has interesting implications for, you know, basically interpreting uh, the deep history of, of tardigrade evolution. And I think the history of a lot of these small and soft bodied things, um, because there is so I mean, there are only these three records in amber of this whole phylum. Um, but if you go way, way back into the Cambrian, into the very start, really, of complex animal life on Earth, uh, there are these Orston uh, fossils. So this is way too early for amber. There's no, uh, there's no plants, really. There's no vascular plants. There's no trees on land that can be producing resin. Uh, it's just sort of algae and animals in the ocean at this point. Um, but there are a few exceptional uh, circumstances where you get these microscopic phosphatized fossils. So their cuticles have been replaced with uh, phosphate um, preserved in limestone. And you get some really remarkable uh, tiny arthropods in this. So these are some, some possible early crustaceans, including this really weird uh, sort of giant eyeballed animal, Cambropachycope on the top. And so the preservation is, is beautiful in these Orston faunas, uh, three-dimensional. Uh, with uh, basically all the little bits, uh, legs, and appendages preserved. Um, and so, like, these are ones from, from Sweden, but there's also Orston fauna from the Middle Cambrian of Siberia that are believed to be some of the earliest tardigrades. So there are these kind of squat, you know, multi-legged, uh, would have been marine creatures that yeah, they do, they do look like tardigrades. Uh, I know there's been some debate among invertebrate paleontologists and tardigradeologists over whether these really are tardigrades and if so, what kind. Um, but it looks pretty, pretty convincing to me. Uh, and I think the arguments uh, for it are strong. And I mean, we do expect them to be present at that age because remember tardigrades are, they're outside of arthropods. And so arthropods definitely already exist by the Cambrian. So the split between tardigrades and arthropods have to be, has to be even earlier than that. So going way back in time, probably as much as you know, 600 million years or more. Um, so where does that leave us? It, well, it's kind of disappointing in some ways. Uh, I mean, it's, I think it's super exciting to have a new tardigrade in a fossil of any kind, just because they're so incredibly rare. But I think it really highlights just how much we don't know, not only about the evolutionary history of heart tardigrades, but about the history of so many uh, ecologically very important groups on Earth today. So if you take basically the entire history of, of animal life, let's say, you know, at least 600 million years, and maybe, you know, go back even more than that, you only have three intervals in Earth history that have yielded a tardigrade fossil. Like that is, you know, infinitesimally small. So, like any disco new discovery uh, when you're dealing with numbers like that is is a big deal. But also, it you know, there's such a huge gap. So we've talked about ghost lineages on old news before. That's periods in Earth history where we know a group of organisms must have been there, but we just have no fossil evidence for it. And tardigrades have a gigantic one. So there's between those late Cretaceous amber fossils and the Cambrian Orston fossils, it's 420 million years of just like missing fossil record with not a single tardigrade fossil. And the same is true for a lot of these, you know, small bodied uh, invertebrate phyla and, and other groups, you know, like protozoans and fungi that have bad fossil records, but are you know, really, we know they're major parts of ecosystems today. So they probably were playing, you know, huge roles throughout much of history, but we just don't have a record of it. We just don't know what's going on. Um, so it's, it's worth keeping in mind how biased the fossil record is for a lot of these groups. Um, like we think about, you know, how many dinosaur fossils we have. And then if you look at things like trilobites or uh, mollusks, you know, the thousands and thousands of fossils we have of those. And there is a lot we can say about them. And, you know, there's some, some strong conclusions that can be made. Um, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. And we're, we're missing so much of what's actually was, was going on in these e ecosystems. And just because of the way the fossil record works, we'll, 
we'll probably never have them. Like we'll never be able to get all those as many fossil tardigrades uh, as these other groups. I mean, when you think about it, like the entire phylum tardigrada of which there's only three to five fossils known, uh, like as many as I can count on one hand is so much less than fossils just of the species T-Rex. Like we're now hitting probably a hundred Tyrannosaurus specimens out there, uh, which is already an order of magnitude of this one species of dinosaur than this entire hugely diverse uh, invertebrate phylum. So just something we really need to think about uh, when we're interpreting sort of the fossil record. Man, and I, with all of those um, specimens of T-Rex, that's even a lot for a dinosaur, right? Yeah, yeah. Would, yeah. Most dinosaur species are only known from a single specimen. Wow. Wow. So I will admit that my knowledge of tardigrades is pretty superficial. Like I know they're cute. I know they're microscopic. I know they are incredible at surviving. They survived all major extinction events in Earth's you know, history, right? They're, they're I mean, still we're, here. We're, 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 I mean, yeah, they clearly they did. Yeah. Um, so I guess, but I, one thing I don't know is just what is their role in the ecosystem? I mean, it differs. So, I mean, they are, uh, you know, they are diverse, so they are not all doing the same thing Amongst, among the, the different groups of tardigrades, sort of the hundreds of species of tardigrades. There are carnivores, there are ones that are uh, detritivores, there are ones that are basically, you know, kind of just like slurping up organic goop. There are ones that are actively mm -hmm. feeding on both other organisms and some even other tardigrades. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, I think there are some that are kind of like grazing on algae and things like that. And so they do it all, basically. I mean, such as you can do at that size. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're trying their best. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. They're great. Uh, wow, that's really cool. So what are some of the important body parts on a tardigrade? And follow-up question, did they were they able to see any of these important body parts, mm -hmm. you know, in the, the new fossil water bear? Yeah. So, I mean, when you looked at those, the, the photos of the different or the, the micrographs, at least of the different amber tardigrades, they all do kind of look the same. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to tell them apart uh, unless you're a, a tardigrade expert. And even then, you know, tardigradeologists, I think need to take a long time looking at different little itty bits of these things under the microscope. Uh, so uh, one of the big differences between the groups of tardigrades is whether they have plates or not. So they all have a cuticle on the body, basically their skin, but some of them also have kind of like armorish plates going on, um, whereas some of them just kind of have a, a lumpy mass. Uh, they don't really have sort of distinct segments to the cuticle. Um, they also have those, you know, you could see the claws, they're bear-like claws. Uh, so those differ. Uh, between species, between groups, in their orientation, their shape. Uh, and then there are also lots of little internal features that are very difficult to see without very high-powered microscopes. So for example, Paradori Phoribius was distinguished by the researchers who were working on this um, by, on the basis of its macroplacoid. So it's different shape from the modern Dory Phoribius. So the macro placoid is having to describe it. It's kind of like, it's a, uh, it's kind of a thickened region of the cuticle in the throat. So it is sort of a, a hardened, uh, you know, organ almost in the, in the throat um, that they use while they're, they're feeding. So they have a, it has a very different macro placoid shape than in Dory Phoribius. Um, and lots of other little things like the, the setae, the, the hairs on them, the orientation and number, um, and you know, various aspects of what uh, orientation of the legs, where they're placed on the body, that sort of stuff. So yeah. they, they all do kind of look the same, but you know, when you look at those fine details, there is, there's a lot of variation. Can you only tell the orientation of the legs when it's moving because I know in still images they all pretty much look like you know like the legs are just like underneath their bodies you know but mm -hmm. yeah well I mean they they're all kind of underneath the body so I guess orientation 
less that than maybe position of like how they're spaced, uh, whether they're closer to the front, whether they're just straight hanging off the back, that sort of thing. Gotcha. So none of them have like arms or legs coming out of the sides of their body. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and back to the settee, the little hairs, are mm -hmm. those only on their hands for lack of a better term project their little projections their hands or legs yeah are they, are they only there or do they cover their body and then like what do they use them for so there are some that uh that have sort of big hair like structures kind of sticking out of the back almost kind of like paired hairs over the shoulder um mm -hmm. and so most uh you know, in most little invertebrates that have setae, they have sensory function. So they help them interpret the world around them um, connected to the, in this case, very simple nervous system and feeling like changes in the water. Okay. So um, are they using it sort of to sense like movement vibrations usually? Like they don't have any um, scent receptors that we know of, do they? Like, can they smell? Uh -huh. I'm not sure about that actually. I don't know if they have they have scent receptors. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm I imagine they have they must have some kind of uh, ability to interpret the chemistry of the water around them because uh, I think that's important in you know as they undergo cryptobiosis. Uh, yeah, that's helping to <laughs> helping to understand you know if the water is becoming hyper saline, for instance, um, like if it gets salty. Su super salty. Uh, that's one of the things that can drive them into to cryptobiosis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know if they like if they smell really. It's it's difficult, you know, with a lot of invertebrates. Like when we, their nervous system is is so different than than ours. When we talk about oh, like a a butterfly is smelling with its feet, or yeah. you know, such and such animal can hear with uh, with its legs is. Yeah, they do, but it's not it's not really the same as as yeah. we understand. Um, these are all chemical and physical stimuli that are being input into their brains, or if some of them don't even have brains, just kind of like uh, neural ganglia, uh, as as best as it can, and presumably has the same effect, but but isn't quite you know quite the same as as us like smelling a fresh baked pie or something, <laughs> right? Yeah, I imagine that wouldn't be super useful to a water bear. They mm -hmm. don't live in our fresh baked pies, right? They just live in like, the, you know, the ground, the like moist dirt and like marine and uh, pond environments, right? Yeah. Not pond, but fresh water. Well, I mean, they do live in ponds, though. So. Right. I, I just meant like the umbrella term, like pond. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, so... On this fossil, you showed us a few pictures, and one of them was kind of pretty. It was like a rainbowish little uh -huh. water bear. Um, so I assume that was taken with a high-powered microscope. And um, does that show us anything inside that particular fossil? Yeah. So I mean, those sorts of microscopes. Um, so I mean, there's there's a lot of different types of microscopes out there. Um, and so like the black and white ones of the modern ones are of, of scanning electron. Um, but then there's also, you know, very powerful confocal microscopes. So basically you're trying to look through different layers of these tiny little things because at high enough magnification, even um, a micron or less difference in the, the plane of the slide really, uh, it starts to get blurry. So you really only have, you know, a tiny little bit. So uh, what some of this does is, and again, this is nowadays, it's not, you know, you put a specimen under a microscope and you put your eyeball down there and you turn the crank and that these are, uh, these are being done digitally. So these are being put in, they're in laboratories that are then, then processed with computers. And so those, those colors aren't really there. Uh, I mean, those are, that's applied by a mixture of, of light and then interpreted by the computer, basically, uh, to show different different layers of of the structure, and also uh, sometimes uh, I don't know actually if that was done for this specimen in particular, but it can you can even put things like fluorescence in there to to highlight internal organs in small things under the microscope. Hmm. Yeah, and I know that um, so tardigrades are not arthropods. 
That's right. But right. they're similar to arthropods in some ways. And I know that there are a lot of arthropods that are fluorescent, you know, like they're, they can glow underneath um, fluorescent light, like a, back, a black light. Mm-hmm. Um, is that true for water bears as well? Or So I don't think, you know, I don't think pe- that research has necessarily been done. So we're doing, like, we're learning a lot of animals are fluorescent now that we thought weren't. Like even uh, vertebrates, even like some mammals that turn oh. out to be fluorescent. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, once a few people showed that, oh, chameleons have fluorescent bones, all of a sudden they're like, oh, wait, we got to just put fluorescent lights on everything and see what lights up. And yeah, it turns out a lot of animals do. And so, especially when you're looking at like a whole phylum, like you can't generalize, like we don't know, uh, if there are any, like there could be you know, we, you could try one tardigrade and there's still hundreds of other species of tardigrade that you need, would need to check. I think it is, you know, I, I think it's probably unlikely just because these are for the most part kind of translucent organisms that are not dealing like other organisms in their environment are not necessarily visual predators. Mm -hmm. So like, they're dealing with protozoans and other sort of myofaunal things that are trying to hunt them or interact with them is it's mostly uh, tactile it's by touch or chemical senses so a lot of the fluorescence in larger organisms is is related to animals wanting to to see at those wavelengths so either to uh you know try to scare away predators or attract a mate or you know attract pollinators these sorts of things so when you're when you're essentially like clear and all the things that are hunting you are eyeless, it's probably <laughs> less important. Um, right. But you know, I, I don't know. I I really uh, have no idea until until we actually test it and see. Yeah. I don't think we'll know. Cool. I'm, it's a little crazy to think about. Um, just there's like a whole other world going on. A whole other microscopic world mm-hmm. you know? and sometimes when you think about it it's it's a little overwhelming yeah it's, it's because you know most of the microscopic organisms that we think of like you know bacteria and viruses and protozoans are they're you know they're just kind of like little globs moving around but like tardigrade it's also kind of a little glob but it's also like it's a little dude it's got legs it kind of looks like a little bear you can see it crawling around and it like will grab stuff and eat stuff so it seems it seems more of our world just at a tiny scale than say like an an amoeba is for instance Mm -hmm. i wonder if anybody has like a pet water bear i'm sure people who study them in labs are like you know they get like attached i feel like i would get attached to them if i was looking at them every day (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think it's just based on their size. It's very difficult to have like a single pet water bear. You're going to lose it. Um, But yeah, so people who work on tardigrades, they do, they, they, they will culture them. So like some of these other microscopic organisms, you know, you sort of basically create a culture of have a, a laboratory environment that is very basically good for them that has the nutrients and food that they need so they can reproduce and you can get kind of a colony of them going on to research. Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, most, most biologists have some sort of attachment for their study organisms. So I'm sure tardigradeologists are, are, uh, are fond of their colonies. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we're... Maybe, maybe they hate them. Maybe they're just like when they're doing the, the experiments where they <laughs> expose them to, very high radiation they're like yeah well let's real see if they can survive this oh no <laughs> hopefully not. not i mean yeah, hopefully hopefully not <laughs> i'm sure there's like a kind of morbid curiosity there you know mm-hmm. like i'm just gonna expose you to just crazy things and we'll what see. can you survive yeah yeah that that would be a good um I don't know if that, I like, part of me wants to see a show, you know, where they just, try, they just try the craziest things and like, can a water bear survive, like, being in a bowl of tomato soup? Or like, can huh. it survive 
I don't know. I I can't think of any other conditions, but I, I don't know. I'm curious, but I'm also like, I don't hurt the water bears. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, that does come down to like, can you kill this animal? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so don't do that, people. Yeah, we're yeah. not encouraging. <laughs> we're not encouraging that. Um, so we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask a couple questions about um, amber fossils in particular. Yeah. So, um, so amber fossils they come from, like you said, like the the sap that kind of dries into sap from a tree that dries and becomes like a resin. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned that there were some vertebrates that got stuck and became amber fossils. I have not heard of that. So what kind of vertebrates or animals with a, a backbone have gotten stuck in amber? So lizards and frogs, amphibians, mostly the things kind of that you expect to be moving around in, uh, in tropical ecosystems. So there's a, in, in Baltic amber. So there's the major there, there are a few areas that are like really well known for producing amber. Dominican Republic is one of them. Uh, in the Baltic region, in uh, basically on the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe, uh, there is there's a lot of amber deposits there. And so that's from ancient forests older than the ones in the Dominican, Dominican Republic going back, but still early age of mammals, early tertiary. Um, and those are sort of the best known amber beds because they've just been studied for hundreds of years at this point. Wow. And mostly insects in there, but yeah, there's occasional like bits of lizard that you get. Um, there are uh, there are amber deposits that are yielding feathers, and some have argued dinosaurs. Now, well, birds are dinosaurs, so if it's feathers, yeah. it is dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, but that's a it's an ethically fraught uh, issue because where the amber is coming out of is in the midst of a genocide. And so it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very, very problematic issue. Let's say that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so my last question, are we able to get DNA from amber fossils, you know, like in Jurassic Park? Yeah. So probably not. Um, maybe some of the younger ones, but actually, Amber is very bad at preserving DNA. So Amber is great at preserving sort of the whole body, the morphology of these tiny little things that would never get preserved otherwise. Like even insects that have, you know, fairly robust carapaces, uh, when you get them preserved outside of Amber, they're mostly kind of like a schmear. Uh, they're just two dimensional against a rock. So even in like really high quality, like lithographic limestone or oil shale, things where you get really good preservation, they're basically two-dimensional so you can't see the fine details of the like their mouth parts uh and other sort of taxonomically important parts of their body whereas in amber you have basically the whole thing in three dimensions so it's really good at that but amber is also a desiccant so it, it dries things out um and amber you know itself it isn't just it's not nothing it's you know the resin has its own chemicals in it that alter the the chemistry of what it's trapping um, so it basically, uh, the preservation in amber is very bad for the DNA. So it tends to denature it, it, you know, DNA does not deal well with just being altered like that. Uh, it degrades quickly as a biochemical already, and it probably in amber, it's degrading even faster. So especially going back to like Mesozoic ambers where you could get like dino DNA, Jurassic Park style, uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have it. There have been certainly lots of other organic uh, molecules coming out of amber specimens. So amino acids and proteins have been found in amber insects. Um, but even then, you know, it's uh, it's pretty scrappy stuff. So no like whole genome uh, coming out of amber animals. Not like we're getting out of like ice age mammals now mm -hmm. where the the ancient DNA preservation tends to be better. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. The Pleistocene Fun Park. Yep, and they're, they're it's in the news again. They keep they keep trying oh. trying for it. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we'll see about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, that's all, folks. That's all the time we have today for old news. So, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Christian, thank you for sharing your expertise. I learned yeah, so much about water bears today. They're an amazing group. 
Yeah. I wish and we had Amber more fossils. Bear. I wish we had more fossils of them. Oh, uh, well, maybe now that they're trending, you know, we'll yeah. get some more funding for, uh, I don't know, for people to sort through all the amber fossils yeah, in the hey. world and look for tardigrades, I guess. Any, anything's possible. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. Well, uh, mark your calendars for November 9th. That is our next program, November 9th at 1 p.m. I'm going to put the link in the chat. And we don't know what topic it's going to be because sometimes we don't know the topic till the day before. Sometimes a few days before. Um, it just depends on what's in the news. Exactly. <laughs> So, so yeah. ripped from the headlines. <laughs> right. um, but thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We hope you have a great day and we hope to see you next time. Bye. Have a good one, everybody. Stay safe out there.